after the discussion on the Bessel II and the different kind of revisions are made against that, mostly what we have seen the Bessel II is basically is extension of the Bessel I and in the Bessel II we have given the importance of operational risk that is number one and as well as the we also have developed certain different approaches to calculate the credit risk, market risk and operational risk by that the proper capital requirements can be considered can be calculated accordingly. So, then uh, we can come to the uh, Bessel III which is uh, a new norms which was started uh, uh, of late uh, particularly this was started in 2010. Then as after a series of meetings and all this particular uh, kind of norms came into existence and those kind of uh, things were developed to overcome the shortcomings of the Bessel II and uh, there is some kind of advancement what the Bessel III has made in terms of the requirements of the uh, capital adequacy ratio and as well as there are some other type of uh, uh, aspects or importance has been given to the liquidity and other aspects of the commercial bank. So, today we will be discussing both these things then through that they are trying to manage the capital in a better way to make this bank more stable and as well as uh, uh, we can say that the sustainability of uh, the banks will be maintained and the failure will be less. So, here first question is why Basel 3? The Basel 3 was implemented because or Basel 3 was started because there was some limitations, some loopholes were there in the Basel 2. Then what are those loopholes? First of all, the Basel 2 was not designed, it was not structured for the framework uh, for the changes in the market risk due to the new market developments and the practices. Because of the developments, because of certain changes in the market, banks are more exposed to market risk, but the dynamics of those changes has not been captured through the norms which are given by the Basel II. This is number one. The capital charge for the market risk in the trading book calibrated much lower, uh, lower, much lower compared to the banking book positions on the assumptions that markets are liquid and positions can be owned off or be hedged quickly, but which is not real. So, the positions what the banks have they cannot be hedged off very quickly, they cannot control, they cannot minimize the risk so easily, because the market is more dynamic and the changes and fluctuations in the market also is very much random. So, in this considerations a kind of uh, cautionary or precautionary move or approach has to be followed by the bank to observe all those losses what the bank can expect from the market fluctuations. So, those things are not uh, basically were there whenever we have uh, uh, discussed about the Basel II. So, the bank capital charge for specific risk in market risk framework was lower than the capital charge for the credit risk in the banking book. The banks are really exposed to more risk, but those kind of risk were basically not considered or there was no scope in the Basel II norms that how those things can be captured through the actual problems what the bank is facing. And for that is there any kind of provisions, any kind of kind of uh, caution should be there. So, those kind of things is basically not explained through the Basel II norms. So, because of that they were trying to develop or they are trying to ex expand that vessel to norms in such a way that those dynamics can be captured through that. The counter capital charge for counterparty credit risk for derivative positions uh, also covered only the default risk and the migration risk which was not captured in the vessel too. The global financial risk which has happened in 2008 this was basically happened mostly in the areas of trading book or balance it derivatives. All these things are basically uh, was not discussed or maybe was not explained through the Basel II norms. And the most important thing is the major problem also the global financial crisis always contributes the or maybe the responsible factor for the global crisis is the liquidity problem. 
So, the liquidity aspect was not given due considerations in the Basel II also. So, banks have suffered heavy losses in the trading book and banks did not have adequate capital to cover those losses whenever this kind of crisis has taken place. So, insufficient liquidity asset to raise finance during the stressed period, the liquid assets were not sufficient. If they are not sufficient, then raising more kind of uh, or to cover up those losses what the banks are immediately facing due to the different crisis, then that is also was a problem for the banks because they are not able to cover up those liquidity positions. So, liquidity should be given the due considerations that was very much needed, but Basel II was totally silent about that. So, in these considerations in 2009, uh, the G20 leaders basically has uh, 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 thought of, the G20 leaders have thought of that we should have a expanded and strict regulatory norms by that the banking sector can be uh, made more stable and uh, as well as the liquidity problems should not be much higher in that context. So, their objective was uh, they are basically committed to strengthen the regulatory system for the banks and other financial firms which are operating in the different countries. Act together to raise the capital standards, the capital standards should be improved. Implement strong international comparison standards which can aim at the ending practices that lead to excessive risk taking. The banks should not take excessive risk because they are handling with the public money, the public deposits. They have also committed to improve the over the counter derivatives market to create more powerful tools to host the large global firms to account for the risk whatever they have. So, these are the different kind of agenda whatever they have kept and with uh, this uh, the there is the emergence of the Basel 3. So, that is why the Basel committee on banking supervision that is uh, released the comprehensive reform package which is known as Basel 3 a global regulatory framework for more resilient banks and banking systems which is known as the Basel III capital regulations. And it is started in December 2010 and with series of the modifications it came into the force in 2013. So, now uh, what basically has happened that originally it was published in 2010 after this G20 summit. And, uh, from 2013 to 2019 in the different phases, this, uh, this has to be implemented in the different countries and uh, the regulatory body's responsibility is to ensure that all commercial banks are basically uh, following that particular practices or particular kind of guidelines what the Basel III has recommended. So, in this context, it raises both quality and quantity of required regulatory capital base of the commercial bank. And uh, the basic objective of the Basel III is to improve the banking sector's ability to absorb the shocks, which are very much random in nature. And the shock can be captured or shock can be always created with respect to the changes in the policy. The shocks also can be expected with respect to other kind of uh, market fluctuations. So, how these banks can able to absorb those losses? So, those for that they have, they have basically revised the guidelines in such a way by that the banks will be able to capture those losses and absorb those losses and make that particular system more uh, stable. And also it is as another objective to reduce the risk spillover to the real economy that if there is any kind of problem happens that that the spillover effect uh, from the banking sector to the economic uh, real sector is relative should be relatively less. So, in this case uh, there are two major regulations, uh, the broad regulations they have made uh, that covers of both the individual bank level that is called the micro prudential regulations, then the system wide basis or the macro prudential regulations. So, some kind of guidelines is targeting towards the individual banks uh, policies and some of the guidelines were basically targeting the whole aggregate economic policies by that the uh, we can say that uh, a kind of coherence can be maintained between the individual banks or banking sector with respect to the real economic indicators. So, then the probability of failure in that particular system will be relatively less. 
So, whenever you talk about the uh, micro and macro potentials, the micro potentials is basically uh, the basic intention was to raise the resilience of the individual banking institutions in the period of the stress. If there is any problem with respect to different kind of unsystematic risk the bank is facing, then the how the bank can maintain their stability that is basically the micro potential uh, approach or micro potential regulations what the Basel committee was trying to give them passes. And uh, the reforms also have a macro potential focus which tries to address the system wide risk which can build up across the banking sector as well as the uh, pro cyclical amplification of these risks over time. So, in this context there are these are the two things one is overall development of the banking sector uh, another one is the sustainability of that particular bank in the bad times or in the stress times. So, these are two major things what the Basel 3 was trying to highlight whenever they were talking about the emergence of the regulatory norms for the uh, commercial banks in terms of the management of the capital. So, the macro prudential aspect of the Basel 3 has largely uh, concentrated in the capital buffers. They have started a concept of capital buffers and due to the fluctuations in the market, the buffer should be there by that they whatever losses the bank is going to face that losses can be absorbed through these capital buffers. So, because of that they have started the concept of the capital conservation buffer and the counter cyclical buffer which is related to the economic fluctuations. And the basic intention of keeping those buffers is to protect the banking sector from periods of the excessive credit growth. So, if the bank is exposed to more credit risk or the bank is exposed to more market risk with respect to the market fundamentals change then what we can do that uh, those kind of uh, uh, conservation buffer will help the bank uh, to get out of that particular problem or the losses can be absorbed through that particular buffer whatever the banks hold. So, in this context uh, what Basel 3 has done Basel 3 has not replaced Basel 2 it is basically the strengthens is uh, Basel 2 and uh, Basel 2 basically focused on the asset side of the balance sheet, but Basel 3 mostly addresses the liability side like your capital and the liquidity. So, they are, uh, they are mostly highlighted mostly on the risk weighted assets, how to risk uh, weight should be given, how basically we can say that the uh, denominator can be controlled and by that the capital adequacy ratio can be controlled. But here in the Basel 3, the they try to cover up that loopholes because in Basel 2 if you observe the capital was not that way controlled the capital regulations were relatively less with respect to the numerator of the capital adequacy ratio. But whenever you talk about the Basel 3 mostly they are trying to highlight the liquidity side of the commercial banks which uh, comprised of both capital and the liquidity. So, the new framework uh, will basically impose a higher capital adequacy ratio including a new ratio focusing on common equity. Uh, which also focus on the increased capital charges for many activities particularly who are involved uh, involved in the counterparty risk of that particular process. Uh, it also uh, focuses or maybe will try to narrow the scope of the tier 1 capital and tier 2 capital. That means, it is a more stricter more con uh, we can say that robust kind of uh, ratio what the vessel 3 has recommended whenever they were talking about the different type of uh, capital adequacy ratios measurement of the commercial banks. So, then again here also they have three pillars. First pillar is the calculation of the regulatory capital requirements for credit market and operational risk which was there before in the Basel 2 with certain modifications. Then pillar 2 talks about the uh, supervision again that how the process can be reviewed for the overall capital adequacy and the process under which the supervisors evaluate how well the financial institutions are assessing the risk and accordingly take appropriate actions uh, in response to that assessment. That means, periodical assessment of the capital adequacy ratio has to be done and what kind of uh, supervisory policy the policy makers are taking up to regulate that particular thing. And if there is certain kind of loopholes with respect to that and how that loopholes is going to be overcome by this regulatory bodies using this different implementations of the regulatory norms. Then pillar 3 again it based upon the disclosure norms only 
uh, what are those things the bank has to uh, disclose to everybody in the public forum and as well as to the regulatory bodies. And this disclose the requirements for the banks basically to publish certain details of the risk capital and the risk management with an aim of basically strengthening the market discipline. And if it, there is a lot of transparency and in terms of the actual disclosures the bank will make, then it will improve the effective risk management by allowing the comparison of the performance across the sectors through this uh, disclosure requirements. Because one bank will come to know that what the other bank's risk management policy they are adopting by that their credit exposure uh, and uh, uh, other things like capital adequacy ratio is maintained and as well as they are less exposed to credit risk, market risk or the operational risk. So, by that a sound banking system can be created through this market discipline and once the transparency will be created through this in the, in the context of pillar 3, the disclosures were giving lot of importance to that. But again we will come back to our basic objective is how the capital is regulated under the Basel 3. So, again the same thing basically same philosophy or same logic they have adopted whatever policy or whatever uh, logic was adopted in the Basel 2 implementations. In the Basel 3, they have basically kept certain fundamental things intact and they have made certain modifications to make that particular thing more robust. Uh, so, here, uh, here this uh, basic objective was the increase the requirement of minimum tier 1 capital, increase the standards of instruments to qualify as tier 1 capital, because uh, all the capitals comes under a particular category cannot be considered as the tier 1 capital. This they have increased the standards uh, to make it more qualitative. Then harmonization of tier 2 capital or the instruments and the elimination of tier 3. And Basel 3 has recommended there is no need of tier 3 capital. The tier 1 and tier 2 are sufficient enough to understand the dynamics of the capitals. There is no need to have a separate capital base for the market risk part. Then they, they also revise the appropriate capital deductions such as minority interest and default tax assets whatever the commercial banks have. Then accordingly what happens that the total capital adequacy ratio is going to be changed. Because if you are making lot of changes in the numerator which is nothing but the capital, then automatically your capital adequacy ratio is going to be changed even with the other risk aspects whatever Basel 2 has recommended that will be kept intact. So, then uh, what are those recommendations the Basel 3 has given? The Basel 3 has kept again that 8 percent uh, minimum 8 percent uh, capital adequacy ratio as usual which was there before. And they have made a change that the minimum common equity which they should have that is the 2 percent which was before they have increased to 4.5 percent. The out of the, uh, and the tier 1 capital which was there 4 percent minimum they have increased to 6 percent. So, these are the major changes whatever they have made because their basic importance was to uh, always uh, uh, they have given towards the tier 1 capital and they also have narrowed down the definition of the tier 1 capital which was there in the Basel 2 to make that particular system more stringent and uh, by that at any kind of uh, at any point of time if this bank is exposed to any kind of problems and or any kind of uh, uh, liquidity issues or any kind of uh, uh, loss issues then that can be easily compensated by the capital base what the bank is holding. The that is why they have in, in the context of the market fluctuations in the context of the cyclic uh, changes in the in the economy they have started the uh, buffer the capital conservation buffer. So, in this case they have kept the capital conservation buffer above the regulatory minimum requirement of 2.5 percent and met with the common equity counter cyclical buffer with a range of 0 to 2.5 percent which is uh, uh, basically depends upon the country and that particular buffer they want to keep uh, to uh, fully loss uh, absorb the losses for the capitals uh, fully absorb the losses of the activities what the bank is intended to get in the future. So, the buffer is to be implemented by the national supervisor like the central bank when there is excessive credit growth of the economy. And this buffers basically are designed to restrict the bank's ability to distribute its earnings until the buffers are rebuilt. So, the return earnings basically uh, uh, can be 
or the whatever earnings the bank has, this can be distributed among the shareholders. But unless the particular level of capital is not maintained, then there is a restrictions in terms of the distribution of the earnings what the what the particular bank is making. So this is basically the major kind of changes what which was recommended, uh, which have reco which have been recommended by the Basel Committee, and uh, it was the basically part of the capital regulations part whatever we are discussing with respect to Basel 1 and the Basel 2. So, another recommendations what they were they have given that uh, uh, global financial services firms, some of the firms are called the systematically important financial institutions, uh, almost exclusively the banks they are so big that governments believe that they will be forced to rescue these institutions rather than risk lasting damage to the world's financial system. Because you know that the importance of the bank is so large, importance of the bank is so important and in that context that the uh, dependency on the common man's uh, is always uh, on the banking sector is quite high. So, therefore, they want to have certain kind of precautionary move, they want to have always uh, uh, to impose a kind of precautionary move by that the failure of that particular system, the probability of failure of that particular system will be relatively less. So, the systematic financial institutions have loss observing capacity they should have and the additional law, uh, loss observance requirement are to be met with a progressive common equity tier 1 capital requirement which range from 1 percent to 2.5 percent. So, if there is any kind of problems happens with respect to this, then the enough capital base should be maintained in that particular system in such a way by that this particular loss can be observed through that particular buffer whatever they are holding. For banks facing the highest SIB, uh, systematically important bank uh, surcharge and additional loss observance of 1 percent could be applied as a dis disincentive to increase the, uh, materially their global systematic importance in the future. Some banks are not considering about the cost aspect and other thing. So, in the due process they are incurring the loss. So, because of that a 1 percent loss uh, uh, additional loss observancy is applied to those banks to make them more streamlined or more, more uniform whenever they want to have some kind of business in the banking sector. So, these are the different major kind of guidelines whatever they have given. And according to Basel 1 that uh, uh, bank basically remains a going concern approach that means, the whenever they are providing this loans and all these things they should have an idea that uh, what kind of future cash flow this particular entity is uh, uh, going to uh, generate in the future and whether the loans whatever the particular entity has taken. The loan has uh, uh, kind of we can say that the bank should have enough kind of capital with them or enough kind of quality of the capital should be with them by that they can capture or they can absorb any, any other losses from the credit disbursement what the bank has already made. The, it is the highest quality form of the bank's capital as it can be used to write up the losses whatever the bank has because the capital is going to compensate that. Then they also have uh, added this uh, hybrid or trying to intend the hybrid capital instruments with set of uh, clauses which are which are there has been phased out. Which are not included in this that uh, uh, reductions which are there common equity are among others goodwill, minority interest, deferred tax asset, provisioning shortfalls bank investments in its own shares and bank investments in other banks, financial institutions and insurance companies uh, are not considered in this particular context because uh, to avoid this double uh, counting of the equity. So, these are the basically the tier 1 capital what the that means, mostly it is the common equity what the bank has to keep and uh, the capital base should be quality should be so high that at any point of time they can write up those losses what they are going to incur. The tier 2 capital's objective was to protect the depositors in the event of insolvency and uh, it is basically recategorized as a going concern reserve. The reason is that it is uh, the subordinate debt again is eligible. So, here basically at any point of time the depositors should not have any kind of problem in terms of their liquidity requirements and other things. By that the tier 2 capital should be kept in a particular level. So, to absorb any kind of losses what the bank is expected to make whenever they are dealing with this tier 2 capital like this. 
and the concept of tier 3 capital was completely abolished by the Basel 3 and the T 3 capital is the short term sovereignty debt was uh, uh, used under Basel 2 to support the market risk, but that concept is not there in the Basel 3. So, the concept of the uh, we can say that tier 3 is uh, totally absent in the Basel 3 norms or the Basel 3 recommendations to avoid any kind of confusions in the market. Then uh, there is a counterparty credit risk, here the it basically measures the intended to address the perceived deficiencies in the Basel 2 during the period of uh, acute market volatility. Already to some extent we have discussed this, but here what they are trying to say, the capital requirements must be determined using the stressed input when ca calculating the counterparty credit risk. So, in the normal condition it should not be con always calculated, it will be considered in the stressed conditions. The banks must implement a new capital charge that is basically your credit value adjustment charge to cover the risk of the mark to market losses on the expected counterparty risk to the OTC market or OTC derivatives. This is basically additional default risk for the capital charge. So, because of that some extra amount of capital can be kept to overcome any kind of losses what they are expecting for investment in that particular kind of assets. Then we have uh, another thing is that the bank must implement a new capital charge for the wrong way risk. The wrong way risk is basically arises when the credit exposure it at default is positively uh, or we can say that the credit is uh, adversely and exposure is uh, uh, when the exposure at default is positively correlated with the probability of default and when the default risk is there the credit exposure increases. So, in that context they have to ensure that wh what is the probability that this particular thing is going to happen. So, considering that what basically they do, they basically apply a multiplier of 1.25 to the asset value correlation of exposure to basically find out or to regulated financial firms with the assets of 25 billion dollar. Since uh, the uh, ABC or the asset value correlations were 25 percent higher during the crisis of the financial versus the non financial funds. So, this is basically the another regulations or another kind of uh, recommendation the Basel 3 has given. The banks will be required to apply the tougher margining periods uh, to determine the capital requirements whenever they have large and illiquid derivative exposures to the counterparty. Then the lower risk weightings for country party risk exposure may be applied if they deal with the centralized exchanges that meet certain criteria. If any company is doing the business uh, in the foreign uh, exchange business or uh, foreign sector, then it is very much required to have also that uh, how that uh, particular risk is captured the, or the particular losses what the bank is going to make due to the fluctuations of those uh, in terms of the capital base whatever they have. So, this is the way basically this uh, framework has been designed to uh, adjust the risk of the commercial bank, but mostly the Basel 3 has uh, highlighted in the capital part not in the risk part. So, now uh, they have started the concept of capital leverage ratio. Uh, so, here your tier 1 capital divided by the risk exposure limit should be greater than or equal to 3 percent. So, as a pillar 2 measure to start, but will be integrated with pillar 1. Leverage ratio will be tracked from January 2011 to C the result of the above definition and parallel run from January 1 2013 to 2017 and final adjustment in 2017 and it is disclosure from January 2015. As pillar 1 ratio from January 1 2018, these are the different deadlines which has been given by the regulatory body to the commercial banks to implement this Basel 3 in the respective banks. So, whenever we talk about India because as per the Basel 3, they, they have given certain guidelines, but those particular thing can be changed with respect to the different countries. So, in this context uh, although the minimum common equity tier 1 ratio the Basel has recommended of 4 percent, 4.5 percent, RBI has made it 5.5 percent for the Indian commercial banks. Capital conservation buffer it can go up to 2.5 percent maximum, we have kept it maximum that is 2.5. Additional tier 1 capital we have to keep that is it can go from up to 
uh, uh, 2.5%, but we have kept 1.5%. Min, uh, minimum tier 1 capital ratio should be 7% uh, in this case. Tier 2 capital will be 2%, minimum total capital ratio should be 9%. So, instead of 8%, what the Basel 1 has, Basel 3 has recommended, which is a same thing which was happening from Basel 1 to Basel 2 to Basel 3. But in India, we have kept the minimum capital adequacy ratio is 9 percent and the capital adequacy ratio plus capital conservation buffer, what just now we have discussed to overcome the business cycle problems or any kind of market fluctuations, that should be 2.5. So, then we have the capital adequacy ratio, the bank in true sense has to be managed or has to be maintained by 11.5 percent. So, the minimum capital adequacy ratio if you talk about including the uh, conservation buffer of the uh, capital, then we have the 11.5 percent with reference to India. Then the Basel 3 has given lot of importance to the liquidity measures of the liquidity matrix. So, mostly uh, the financial crisis which have taken place in the Indian market and as well as the global market in particular. Mostly, it is not that way affected. Uh, uh, that way affect the Indian market, but mostly, almost all over the world, this is this has a lot of implications. So, mostly the reason was the liquidity problem, liquidity crisis in the system. So that's why considering that Vessel Three has given a lot of importance about the liquidity risk management. So they have proposed two ratios, and the bank has to maintain that ratio properly over the time. One is your liquidity coverage ratio for short term liquidity risk management under a different stress scenario that is number 1. And number 2 they have basically recommended another ratio called the net stable funding ratio, which is basically used for managing the longer term structural liquidity mismatch which is uh, the bank is facing over the time. So, these are the two different ratios which was uh, uh, basically uh, uh, suggested by the uh, Basel 3 for maintenance of or the maintaining the liquidity of the commercial bank. So, what is the liquidity coverage ratio? It is basically designed to ensure that the banks maintains adequate level of uh, on incumbent assets that can meet its liquidity needs for a 30 day period under a severe stress scenario or if, uh, if there is any kind of problem also at least how much LCR the bank is maintaining. It is high quality assets divided by the net uh, uh, cash flow over 30 days minus the day uh, 30 day sorry the uh, net cash uh, net quality assets divided high quality asset divided by the net cash flow over 30 day stressed period. Uh, so, it is that is why it is considered as a liquidity coverage ratio, because it is covering of this particular liquidity with respect to the asset whose maturity period is the 30 days and that particular value should be greater than or equal to 100 percent. That means, how much assets the bank is holding which is covering of the liquidity requirements of the 30 days maturity. So, that is the basic intuition of the liquidity coverage ratio and high quality asset includes uh, that can easily be converted into cash in the stressed market condition. That means, easily those assets are marketable and we can convert those assets into the cash uh, in a, in a, in a appropriate time whenever there is a requirement of the cash by the commercial banks. So, the fundamental characteristics of liquid assets according to Basel 3, low credit and market risk, easy age and certainty of valuation, no co low correlation with the risky assets uh, listed in the developed and recognized stock exchanges. And they have some market related characteristics, they have a active and sizable market, presence of committed market makers for that particular asset, low market concentration, that means market should be competitive, it should not be concentrated and they uh, fly to the quality, the quality of the asset so high, which can be easily sold in the market at the appropriate time. Then we have another issue they have uh, uh, basically suggested that is the net stable funding ratio. They, it is basically designed to ensure that banks hold an amount of long term funding at least equal to its long term asset such as lending. That is why the NSFR which is net stable funding ratio is available stable funding divided by the required stable funding, which should be greater than or equal to 100 percent. And whatever thing is available, that basically should uh, be matched with the required stable funding of the bank. 
this basically depends on the ability of the firms and supervisors to model the investor behavior, which can be stable or unstable on a crisis situation. So, what we have discussed in this particular session that uh, Basel 3 is an extension of Basel 2, which raises both quality and quantity of required regulatory capital basis. Uh, both quality and quantity of regulatory capital basis was been taken into consideration on the Basel 3 norms. And the basic objective of the Basel 3 is to capture the dynamics of the market fluctuations and accordingly how much capital base the bank should always have. And it also gives importance to the liability side largely in comparison to the asset side. And always the importance should be given uh, to the liquidity of the commercial banks uh, with other bank risk and the capital to maintain the liquidity in such a way that the probability of any kind of failure with respect to liquidity should not happen and which was the major cause for the financial crisis and the global financial crisis in the year 2008-9. So, these are the ways basically the capital is measured and capital is basically always analyzed for the commercial banks and the capital is very important because it has the implication on the risk, it has the implications on the liquidity and it has also the implications on the performance of the commercial banks. That is why capital management is a very important issue or capital adequacy ratio has a lot of implications on the overall uh, banking activities including the performance and the other aspects. These are the references what you can go through for this. Thank you.